Hello and welcome to Fierce. This program celebrates the diversity of LGBTIQ identities and perspectives. Fierce is produced in Bundjalan country at 2NCR Lismore and can also be heard on podcast at fiercefm.podbean.com and in New Zealand on Fresh FM as well as all over Australia through the Community Radio Network. This is Peter Lena and I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where you are listening. They took care of these lands sustainably for hundreds of thousands of years and then shared this land with us at great cost to their own lives. I want to honour and thank them for the work they have done and continue to do to care for country and to sit on the earth. I also want to thank the fairies and crones who came before us in history to fight for our human rights to love fiercely. Fierce. 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 And right now on the phone we have Robin Hood. That's Robert Birch, who is a radical fairy here from Canada to run a sex magic workshop for the radical fairies here in our community. Hi, Robin Hood. How are you? Hey, Peter. Doing well. Thank you. Whereabouts in Canada are you from? My husband, Crowdog, and I are living on a small Gulf Island between Vancouver and Victoria, British Columbia, called Salt Spring Island. Wow. Been there for 20 years, farming and gardening and hostessing uh, events and gatherings. So it's actually a radical fairy gathering place? Well, it's in the small, we've got a couple of acres, so we're, uh, we've loved one of the reasons we, we got the place was to be able to to have these gatherings where folks would show up and chill out from the city and come up with some fresh new ideas for, for their lives. What a wonderful man you must be to do all that. <laughs> That's our pleasure. I mean, to be able to share what we've got is what a, a great pleasure for us, yeah. You've also got a background in theatre and you're also quite an academic from what I can tell. I'm a recovering academic. I uh, just got out of a five-year PhD program exploring uh, group sex events and the role hosts play in, in cultural transmission and peer navigation models. Yeah, so that was an exciting adventure. But my background is in theater and uh, primarily in ritual performance work. So my, my nickname was Dr. Orgy. <laughs> looking at <laughs> getting the Canadian Orgy. government to sponsor sponsor this investigation into uh, gay men's sex lives uh, and how we how we experience group sex. Can you tell us a little bit about your findings? Yeah, one of them was we were looking at specifically the role the host plays in both uh, creating the atmosphere, the uh, some of the uh, what was known as um, positive, um, positive deviance was this idea that was actually discovered in India around childhood uh, nourishment. And how did some parents keep their children more? Uh, how did they keep them alive? And they found out some of them were actually using crayfish in order to feed them. So this idea was born. What, like, how did some people uh, you know, under challenging circumstances thrive or do better? So we wondered how that might fit into a, a world of queer life and how are gay men adaptive in our strategies and how have we applied that to uh, navigating 35 years of HIV and other challenges uh, and how in a higher risk sexual environment such as group sex parties do these hosts play a really particular role around uh, not just by keeping people safer, that was a, one of the findings, but really about creating a culture of support, a culture of uh, creating, creating an environment where people could meet, challenge each other, have these incredible erotic experiences, and navigate some of the, the, the difficulties, whether it was around HIV to even... Uh, how to navigate your drug experience, how to, you know, so it's just not atypical for us who are part of the gay community to know that we really actually inside inside our various uh, rich uh, erotic experiences really help each other navigate those challenges and still have a great time if possible. And that the other side of that, of course, is always where people fall into the cracks and how can these hosts uh, play a role where, where people are supporting each other on a much more conscious level. People call you Dr. Orgy, so how does it feel when people call you that? 
Oh, I laugh. I mean, I'm back in Sydney after 30 years just landing today. And to me, Sydney was a place of a sexual awakening for me. I was 21 years old and I started having all these incredible experiences around anonymous sex. And it was right in the height of the, the AIDS epidemic. And what, when if somebody calls me Dr. Orgy, it makes me think about, well, how did I figure out uh, how did I figure out navigating a really complex time where culture and sex and, and um, community support systems were all struggling to uh, put ourselves onto the map. And so for me, all these years later, being a theater artist and doing a lot of social activism and social uh, discourse around really um, some of the challenges around social justice, how did I end up in this PhD program uh, to explore group sex? Partly I realized was one of the things that my community, and specifically I can say the radical fairy community, learned, uh, really taught me how we as a group of people, when we start taking care of each other, really generate and adapt through the challenges of what it's been to be a queer man in the last 35 years and where, where we have a lot further to go yet to support each other, especially around the issues around people of color and the exploration around gender and sexuality and class. So uh, it's really been a community-based focus. When I'm called Dr. Orgy, it's playful, but really it's an opportunity for me to, to say thank you for all the, the queer elders and friends that have helped me navigate some of my own inner madness. Please share with us some ways that you find are great in supporting each other. Well, specifically, in, I mean, in a group sex event experience, I mean, it was everything we found out that the host, of course, and this is nothing new to us. It's new to maybe some of the, you know, the scholars out there exploring group sex or exploring just gay men's sexuality was when we've been so biomedicalized in our realities, you know, um, this great advent of PrEP in the last few years, um, as well as just navigating the, the discourse and divide between HIV positive, HIV negative men. So we found out that a lot of, and again, no surprise for many of us, a lot of how we've been creating our own culture as gay men has actually been where we, we meet. And pleasure and eroticism being one of the very, the, the frontiers of change on so many levels. It's, it, there's been researchers doing incredible work on just looking at how gay men's uh, exploration of pornography has evolved technology itself. A long, longer story for another time, but there's something about how we follow desire and in doing so, what's been missing a lot of the literature is really like we're creating culture through our, uh, what gives us pleasure and what we're avoiding and what we're attempting to co-create together. So part of this investigation is looking at these parties, these parties with purpose, right? And how people are putting ever more uh, a conscious attempt into uh, creating uh, an event that is as pleasurable as possible with as little harm, right? And for many of us, we also know that, you know, when we're in bed with somebody, as much as the sex can be great, hopefully, uh, there's also a lot of transmission that goes on. So I think of one story where this one fellow, uh, I think he was in his mid-70s, and he'd been throwing these, he and his cohort had been throwing these sex parties for over 25 years. And they were uh, parties that were specifically for daddies and younger men, say in the, anywhere late 20s to early 30s. And these older guys would, it was a, um, they were still operating in that old school system of condoms, and, which was amazing. And they really helped educate some of these younger gay men, both into their own erotic desires, but also how to navigate our culture, our erotic cultures. He tells a story, amazing story when this one young guy was on a bad trip. And uh, instead of phoning his friends or anybody else, he ended up calling him, you know, so he's 45, 50 years older than the guy at the time, um, but 40, I guess. And he was the one that came down and helped him walk through his trip. So there was a different kind of level of trust. You know, we think about gay events and sexual uh, partying. We don't often think about how much trust actually can go into some of these events. And they're very personal and private. And there's a level of 
intimacy that doesn't really get talked about. Certainly intimacy is one of the issues that rarely gets talked about in our culture. And yet it's here. And it's just a place we need to put more, I guess, a caring attention toward. So that's been some of the uh, example. Another example would be this young guy in his early 30s. And he, he found he was kind of in an addictive cycle around his sexual life. He got some support services in the, in the city of Vancouver, and then he was able to re-enter the sex party about a year and a half later with a lot more confidence and trust in himself to actually recognize his pleasure was, for him, he described as a healing focus. So that's been the nature of my work, uh, Peter, is really just like how can pleasure focus on involving our, our relationship to health, wellness, and in some cases, many cases, healing. Thank you. We're chatting to Robin Hood, and he's a queer raised community activist and radical fairy who's here from Canada to run a fairy sex magic workshop. Robin, is there a song that represents trust to you or represents the fun times you've had with the radical fairies being Dr. Orgy? Wow, God. <laughs> I'm, tripping, I'm tripping up being in Sydney because at every street corner and every bar we've, we've passed by or gone into, it, it's only been one day, but everything's coming up the late 80s. Really? Which is, uh, yeah, I'm just kind of going, what, what, and maybe that's just a, that weird constellation because I was here in 1988, but all of a sudden I'm tripping out with, with my 21-year-old self and 51-year-old self having this bizarre conversation. So... It's not about so much uh, a song that was a trust, but my coming out song, like so many of us of that generation, was uh, Small Town Boy, you know, Jimmy Somerville, and how we have to leave experiences of not being seen and oppressed and are reaching out to find one another. That felt like, it feels like a really appropriate song. My younger queer guy looking to find community.
talking to Robin Hood, who was acknowledged as the Victoria Queer Educator of the Year. Yeah. <laughs> Despite oh, yeah, a close a friend deserving it more, apparently. Oh, no, no, that was, that was a few years back. And really, it's only about standing on the the shoulders of a lot of people have done some great work. Victoria is a, a small community, but it's got some big hearted people. I think people like uh, Captain Snowden, who's a major sexologist and also worked at uh, AIDS Vancouver Island. He did a lot of groundwork and lots of people who have uh, taken the role of gay men's health coordinators have gone on to get their PhDs in other areas. And, uh, but really, uh, yeah, an incredible group of people doing what I call uh, peer navigation work, really coming inside from, from a cultural perspective and helping each other out. It's pretty amazing. You're also the co-editor of the Annals of Gay Sexuality. Mm-hmm. What's Queer Possum? Oh, Queer, queer uh, Posium. That was actually, uh, this is something we really love doing, of bringing people just together for like three-day events and a mixture of different workshops and putting it in a bit of a creative framework. That one, we had every, all these queer people on a bus traveling around the, the city looking at queer history moments. We'd get out, do some kind of performance events or some kind of game to reclaim queer space. I'll jump back in the bus and... Uh, uh, doing these, yeah, this is something oh. I've been doing as a queer artist for, for a couple of decades. It's really just these outdoor performance spaces at midnight and gay sex parks and giant speakers playing Mr. Rogers, Welcome to Our Neighborhood. So anything that grabs people's imagination and sense of playfulness is, is one of the, my great passions. Wow, that's so exciting. We've just started here QFAG, which is a queer forest activist group. We've got the same plans to travel around and do theatre. We had our first show at the Ferry Glitter Ball. I heard the Glitter Ball was amazing, seeing all the posts from Facebook. Yeah, congratulations. That's super exciting. I love a lot of the, the queer men who are, who are showing up for eco-activism too. I love putting the, uh, the erotic and the ecological together. Have you got any tips for a young group having had so much experience? Yeah, if, if it's a little bit scary, go for it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, an intergenerational process has really helped. I think this is one of the great divides in our own queer perspectives with the missing generations. We've really lost some of the, the beauty of having older gay men listen to younger folks and be able to skill and strategy share. So doing projects and having some uh, multi-generation uh, in that process is really exciting. So it's just, you know, wherever there's a divide, put a container around it and, and find ways of connecting and using that temporary container. So we used to work around HIV positive, negative, younger, older, different, different racial and cultural premises and just putting ourselves in a shared container where we can be vulnerable together and uh, vulnerable to change the quality of change by giving each other qual- high quality attention. Uh, is, so these gathering at, so these ways of just creating these events that to shake things up, it's so refreshing. I think it's actually good for our mental health. And build community. We were just talking about you and your husband and your connection throughout the time with the Radical Fairies. So are you guys in an open relationship? Yeah, we've been in an open relationship for most of our, uh, yeah, we've been in an open relationship since we met about 21 years ago. Yeah. And so, so that's, you've got agreements you've made to navigate jealousies or there's no jealousy in your relationship? Yeah, I mean, I think jealousy crops up, at, not necessarily anymore. I think we've matured through a lot of the anxieties about being a younger man and the need for the need to be the one who's special and control of, of the relationship. And uh, I think those are stages of development. And I totally honor somebody who wants that monogamous life. Um, I think it can be a little suffocating. Um, if that is being used as a form of manipulation or control in a relationship. I think it's a bit of an assimilationist process. If, if, it's, um, if it is working and attempting to suppress or repress parts of a person or one another and using the other person to do the repressing through a conditioned response, the other side of that is, you know, then there's the extreme of a polyamory. And we have danced around that. I think polyamory is an amazing process. It, what it requires, of course, is a lot of communication. 
And that's often what gets repressed or suppressed in, in some binary style relationship is that level of communication. Polyamory, of course, the, the push pull of any choice, um, I think the, the pull of this, the difficulties, it takes a lot of time. You know, when people have busy lives, so uh, navigating polyamorous relationships uh, is a big lifestyle choice. There's a great book called The Ethical Slut, named, written by Dossie Easton, her writing partner. Highly recommended, and it helps map out and navigate some of those challenges. For Crow Dog and I, I think one of the basic premises is that, you know, uh, there's this great term I love. It's called compersion, which is, and we talk about this a lot in the Radical Fairy. Don't want to even talk about it. We co-create this field of compersion, which is really about enjoying each other's enjoyment and how that is actually this healing, awakening, mind and heart and body expanding experience of really experiencing pleasure when somebody else is experiencing pleasure, which just really generates more pleasure. So why would I ever want to control my, my life partner's pleasure? Like, it's not like a resource for me to, to siphon away. I can actually be generating more pleasure and, and vitality in my own body, mind, and heart when he's experiencing pleasure. I mean, we're still working on this. It's 21 years later. We have our own edges. But really, uh, I would never want to hold him, body, heart, and soul from experiencing what he or what, and he would feel the same way about me. It wouldn't hold me back from investigating and, and expanding my, my own worldview. What Harry Hay called in the, the Radical Fairy workshops, new vistas of consciousness. Being able to explore consciously, lovingly and carefully, uh, expanding our experience of life. I mean, it's one of the great gifts of being with Crow Dog and how he's been an anchor to um, you know, growing food and breaking bread and living a really uh, where life of flora fauna, where I'm about the social and spiritual and expansion of, of uh, community building. And we create this incredible container for each other. So our lifestyle, our offerings to the world are the container, not our control function of needing somebody else to, to live life my way. I mean, frankly, that leads to despair from my perspective, but that's only my worldview. And so you've been blessed in this relationship with Crow Dog for quite a long time. Well, wait till you meet him. He's coming up. Uh, well, hopefully he's, we'll be up in your area around, uh, yeah, this more soon. So you got a chance to meet him. He's a wonderful cook and a great playmate. Is he going to be in the workshop or running the workshop with you? No, he's done the workshop in, uh, himself. So um, Rosie Delicious and Keystone and I are the co-facilitators, and Crow Dog's going to be working with Anand and some other people up in that area at Fairyland uh, to cook for everybody. So we're all volunteers. Nobody's making any money on this. Uh, we're able to cover some of our travel expenses. But really, this is us just giving back to our communities that you know have done everything from save our lives to reawaken our imaginations. So. We're just grateful to be coming to Australia and be able to share some of this work. Ultimately, what we're looking for and just wanting to support if this, um, if people are interested is to be able to uh, have find local and regional facilitators of this process, uh, both to save the workshops of money from travel expenses and have a bit more ecological perspective. But we really want to seed some of this, what I would call some faggot magic that's been around for many decades. Um, and start sharing that. We're just in the process of expanding into other genders and certainly other regions and other countries. And people are really hungry for this. I hesitate to use the word technology, but there's some very specific, simple techniques and, and processes that Harry and John created that ultimately shift our consciousness around uh, sex and intimacy. So, yeah, Crow Dog's going to be there and cooking for us. Beautiful. I believe there's one space available left in the workshop. So listeners, if you're interested to know more, you should get in touch with Robert Birch. Now, how can they contact you? Well, I'd go to the website. It's Fairy Sex Magic. So that's F-A-E-R-Y uh, Sex Magic with a C-K uh, dot org. And although it's a bit of an old school website, we're updating. It'll uh, help you connect to some of the 
the administration side of things. And hopefully what happens is if somebody's interested, um, we often do an hour to an hour and a half, what we call the gatekeep process, just to make sure that you're, you have some experience around uh, reflective practices. So you know that you can hold your own in a, an intense and very intimate setting. Uh, we talk about some of the, the challenges of places where we're still hungry for love and attention. Um, and just basically look at our relationship to sex and intimacy, some of the barriers and some of the desires within that. So we start the conversation to warm, uh, warm us up to the process and see if it's a good fit for you right now. And uh, it's an amazing connective hour and a half. And then when that's, once that happens, people are uh, invited into the seven-day training. And the workshop is from this Saturday, October 20, until October 27th. So it would be very tight to get in there. So we're not even sure we'll have that space left. But if you are interested, please please check out the website. And I'm pretty sure my hunches will be back next year. Uh, we've had a lot of interest. Just not everybody can fit it into this particular time slot. So uh, there's, there's be future options for sure. Well, thank you so much for coming on to Fierce. It's been wonderful to chat to you. And I really look forward to meeting you when you're up in our region very soon. Oh, likewise, Peter. And thanks for the great magic you're, you're doing with this work and the Fierce FM. It's, a, it's a, great, a great gift to us all. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Fierce. Fierce. This program celebrates the diversity of LGBTIQ identities and perspectives. Fierce is produced in Bundjalung country at 2NCR Lismore and can also be heard on podcast at fiercefm.podbean.com and in New Zealand on Fresh FM as well as all over Australia through the Community Radio Network.